Sebastian Mendel Martinez, MMA Net, here with Kayan Johnson, who faces off with Rustam Khabilov here in Moscow for UFC Fight Night 136. All right, so we're here in a pretty historic event. First time the yeah. UFC breaks into one of the world's biggest, not, not just countries, but one of the world's biggest MMA markets as yeah. well. First off, how big do you think this is going to be, not just for, like, Russian MMA, but for worldwide MMA? I think it's going to be huge, man. Like, uh... As we've all seen, um, the Russians are extremely, extremely good at MMA, mm -hmm. um, and they just seem to be coming in more and more and more. So, um, I think you're going to start to see more and more Russian champions. Um, so it would only make sense that they really start promoting heavily out here, especially with the amount of people that are in this country. And uh, you're part of this now, and you have the opportunity for some sort of spiritual revenge, I guess, because you're coming off a loss to Islam Akhachev. Uh, you're facing now uh, Rustam Kabilov, who's you know from a, not just not just Russian national, but from a similar region as well. Is there ever anything you think about about sort of like the national aspect of it, in the same sense of like you know uh, the World Cup in football or something like that, where country versus country, you can get some revenge? <laughs> no, it's not. I don't really. I'm not a nationalistic person in any way. Like. You see, I wore a universal, uh, uh, a, a universal fight kit, yeah. not a Canadian fight kit. Um, I believe we're all one. There, I don't really believe in the whole drawing lines. Um, but for me, it's more about proving to myself that I can beat a certain style of opponent, okay. um, and and using the knowledge that I've applied, uh, using the knowledge that I've learned against Makachev, and applying it against Rustam. Well, in that case, what was it that you did learn and, you know, what sort of similarities and differences do you see? Uh, I just learned a lot about um, reaction time. Uh, I was kind of slipping in and, and waiting a little bit, um, in which ended up bringing me to the very center of his game, the, the, the biggest strength that he had. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to try to shut things down before they happen if not i will shut them down as they're happening instead of waiting for the for the next attack for him to make a mistake okay and that fight unfortunately snapped a, a pretty nice win streak that you had going when, when something like that happens do you sort of like take a larger look and evaluate things or you know is there anything sort of mental threshold you have to get past when you get some something that re really just sort of like as we as we say back home a stick in the wheel uh, it derailed some momentum, but um, that's really very mental, um, and I'm pretty good at overcoming obstacles, and I fight really well when my back's against a wall. Um, so I believe that my back's a little bit against a wall right now, uh, just the state of the UFC with my age and, and also how vocal I've been with fighters' rights. We've seen how the UFC has treated some of the people that have been vocal about fighters' rights in the past. Um, I wouldn't be surprised that if I lost this fight that I would be cut. Um, but it's just allowed me to really let go of the outcome. Mm -hmm. and and let go of my expectations uh, from life and from fighting and from the way the sport is is governed and and everything really and and to just enjoy the process and to know that 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 I'm blessed and that I I will I will be happy and whatever happens will serve me to my highest you definitely come across as one of the most sort of honest and outspoken fighters out there. I mean, fighters are usually perceived as extremely honest and such, but there's usually stuff that you can and can't say. Uh, do you feel that you said that you know you you think you're risking about you know getting cut and stuff like that? Does does no part of that ever affect you or, or when you think about sort of the things that you're saying? Um, not really, because I I'm not the type of person that's going to that's going to live a lie, hmm. regardless of the cost. Right, so if I would have to live a lie and and be untruthful and not be my true self, um, in order to remain within the UFC, in order to remain a, a professional fighter, then it wouldn't be worth it. Nothing's yeah. worth my soul. So um, I have ma a great many talents, and I have a great uh, ability to adapt uh, to changes. So whatever happens is going to serve me to my highest. It will bring me to the place that I'm supposed to be. I do believe, though, that I'm going to shock the world, and <laughs> that uh, I do belong here, and that, that there's a reason that I am here, and that's, that's to be that, that, that voice of truth uh, within in all of this.
Well, like you said, you, you're here, you want to shock the world. Ruslan Kablov, he's a guy who's been kind of a tough nut to crack yeah, for a lot of fighters. Even in his losses, he hasn't necessarily shown any super large holes as such. Uh, what are some of the weaknesses that you think you can exploit? He doesn't have a lot of holes. He has a very safe style. Um, but in that safe style, he's not very diverse either. He doesn't have a wide array of attacks. Um, so I think employing a game plan that uses a lot of variety uh, will frustrate him. Um, and I, I believe that just keeping a high pace uh, will, will shut down his ability to kind of uh, lay and pray and rest in certain situations and, uh, and, and, eat, and win decisions on a couple takedowns. Uh, do you think that perhaps that style of fighting, when you get, yeah, I think, believe he has four straight wins or something like that, that that style of fighting perhaps can hold you back almost as much as a loss in some sense? Because, you know, the way that the fans perceive you and that, you know, the UFC or other organizations perceive you can usually do a lot. We see fighters who, you know, say Justin Gaethje, who, who you know, lost two straight fights but was still in two straight main events. Uh, do you think that's something that might affect him negatively? Uh, definitely does affect him negatively. Uh, he's five straight wins right now. Mm -hmm. And um, because he's always winning decisions, uh, he's a master at winning decisions, um, it, it definitely affects him negatively because the way that the sport is, is organized, the way that the sport is controlled, um, the people that control the rankings also control uh, the money and also control, they control everything, right? They control the title, they control the, 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 the contracts to everybody, they control the rankings. So they can really do whatever they want. Um, they can put whoever they want in the Super Bowl. Mm. And until that changes, until there's some sort of outside governing body that, uh, that is controlling the rankings, I I don't I don't know I don't know if that's going to change. Um, so I would definitely say that because he doesn't really finish anybody, it it definitely hampers him as far as ascension in the rankings. And there's been arguments from you know both fans and media alike that there is perhaps too much focus on the entertainment aspect as opposed to the, the sport aspect. Uh, for example, Brock Lesnar getting the title shot and, and things like that. Uh, but in some ways, it's also been what differentiates MMA from other sports is the entertainment aspect and the personalities. It's a fine line, but is there any way where you feel like where do you feel the line should get drawn? Uh, well, first, MMA is not a sport <laughs> because it, it can't be a sport unless uh, it's merit-based. And as you said, the entertainment value uh, is a lot of the times at the forefront of who ascends the rankings, mm. um, and which is unfortunate. I believe that there is a huge entertainment aspect to mixed martial arts, and that doesn't have to go away by having a merit-based ranking system. Um, we can still have these crazy super fights, Brock Lesnar versus whoever, whatever champion, doesn't matter, but that, that doesn't mean it has to be for the belt. Yeah. And the, the thing is, is with these massive mega fights, like, it doesn't need a belt on it to sell the fight. This fight is going to sell itself. The two people that are involved and the drama that they create and the tension that they create and the conflict that they create within it with, amongst each other is going to sell the fight regardless. I can tell you right now, no matter if Khabib Nurmagomedov and Conor McGregor were champions or not champions, yeah. everybody wants to watch that fight. Definitely. So we don't have to attach belts to these things. And that's really the only, the only difference. That's the only reason why we're not a sport. So I think that eventually the Alley Act is going to go through, um, provided Donald Trump doesn't veto it. <laughs> There's an Alley Act to go through, and we will have a merit-based bank ranking system from an independent governing body so um, and and then we will finally be a real sport we will finally it will finally be okay you won number number five beat number four so they're now number four or number three or however they determine that it works um, but right now it's completely arbitrary we don't know who makes the rankings um, there's, I, I think there's a panel of journalists, right? Yeah, but certain journalists, but you go through them, there's a lot of inactive people. Yeah, a lot of people that nobody has even heard of, and most of those people are not martial artists. They don't know anything about martial arts. They don't know who, looking at one fighter, they don't know if that guy's good or not. Yeah. 
they just know, okay, he beat that guy, so, and he caused a lot of buzz, and they might have somebody in their ear telling them you should put that guy at this number, you know. We don't know what's going on behind closed doors because it's, it's not, it's, nothing's transparent. There's no transparency, which is another arm of the Ali Act, which forces transparency, which is why it's so important for us. Um, but yeah, eventually, eventually things are going to change. Um, it's a matter of time before before this sport finally gets into the light and uh, and fighter purses start raising and people are finally getting paid what they deserve and the less control is had by by the upper echelon of the company, more more control is controlled by the the athletes, the people that are actually bleeding, just like in every other sport, just like in football, just like in basketball, right? Um, Maybe we'll have a CBA, maybe we won't. I would love it if eventually we did have some sort of CBA as well under Project Spearhead if possible. If not, then whatever union comes after it because who knows what's going to happen here. Um, but yeah, eventually, eventually things will turn around. It's just a matter of time. All right. Well, much more insight than uh, I was expecting initially here. Uh, wrapping up, uh, like we said, this is a pretty historic event. Uh, we're here in Russia, and you said you've been here since Sunday. Mm -hmm. What are your impressions of Moscow so far? I like it, man. Everybody seems to be nice. Like, uh, I walked around a little bit. I got to see some of the architecture, some of the history. It was really cool. Um, it's cool to, to walk into and to walk past buildings that have been there for so long and you can just think of like all these things that this building has seen and like people that have stepped here it's just really cool to, to be in a city with that much history cool well i'm sure the city will enjoy your fighting and Rustam Khabilov as well fans at home be sure to stay tuned uh thank you very much and good luck in the fight thank you all right excellent